Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry for the delayed start. We had a few technical difficulties. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Maura. Uh, usually I'd introduce myself as someone who works at Fox, but I don't anymore. <laughs> um, but I'm very happy to be here and, and to be back and helping and joining the discussion. I'm currently a D4 student in human geography, uh, and I'm, I'm here to facilitate the discussion. Uh, so first I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, so our first speaker today is Dr. Jose Lina Nafafe. Uh, Jose is the Senior Lecturer in Portuguese and Lucifone Studies and also co-director of the MA in Black Humanities and co-director of uh, teaching for Hispanic, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Bristol. Uh, Jose's talk today is titled The Black Atlantic Abolitionist Movement, Lorenzo de Silva Mendoza's 17th Century Case Against Atlantic Slavery. Africans' involvement in the abolition of slavery is often confined to cases of shipboard revolts, maroon communities, and individual fugitive slaves. In this paper, Jose examines the highly organized international scale legal case for liberation headed by Angolan nobleman Lorenzo Silva de Silva Mendoza. Uh, Jose argues that uh, movements for the abolition of slavery led by an African solidarity with other marginalized groups predates European abolitionists. The court case presented in the Vatican on the 6th of March, 1684 by Mendoza argued for the abolition of slavery, uh, included groups of African descent in Spain, Portugal, Brazil, as well as constituencies of new Christians and Native Americans. This scale of this international initiative calling for abolition of slavery in the Atlantic led by Africans themselves has hitherto not been part of the history of abolitionist movements. In his address to the Vatican, Mendoza questioned the institution of Atlantic slavery using four core principles to bolster his argument, human, natural, divine, and civil laws. Jose argues that Mendoza's relationship with new Christians, native Brazilians, and other Africans was central to a distinct case for universal human rights, liberty, and humanity. So Jose will be our first speaker today, uh, but before we go ahead, I will introduce our second speaker as well. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Machilu Zimba, uh, and Machilu is the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion Manager at uh, UCL. Uh, Machilo's talk today is titled Addressing Barriers to the Progression and Success of Graduate Students in UK Higher Education, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Practice. It is unsurprising that graduate students entering UK higher education face barriers to their progression and success. These obstacles are different depending on individual factors such as nationality, one's gender, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, or religious beliefs. Universities aiming to attract and develop talented students cannot and should not shy away from addressing these barriers through evidence-based interventions. Today's presentation and discussion will focus on the barriers international graduate students face and outline how universities are using equality, diversity, and inclusion interventions to overcome them. So the structure of today's uh, discussions will be, uh, Jose will speak uh, first for about 15 minutes, and then immediately afterwards, we'll have uh, Machilo uh, present for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have the Q&A right at the end. So please remember to make note of your questions that you could ask to both Jose and Machilo uh, at the end of both uh, talks today. Uh, so with that introduction, I would like to welcome uh, Jose. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Maura, for that warm introduction. And um, so let me just get this sorted. Okay. Yeah, the title of my, uh, of my talk or my book that I'm going to talk to you about today is the Black Atlantic Coalitionist Movement. Lorenzo da Silva Mendoza, 17th century case against Atlantic slavery. This is a case I have argued very strongly in this book that it is one of a kind, extraordinary, breathtaking, 
evidence where there will be used to show clearly what has happened during that period. Some of the evidence that I have used in the book have not been used by any historian of Lusophone Atlantic, be that Atlanticist or be that Africanist or the historian of West Central Africa in general have not used them. Um, and that could include John Thornton, Linda Haywood, Mariana Candido, Domingos, and many others you could mention. Joseph Miller, who passed a couple of years ago away now, and so on. They have to use those documents. So this is what the book is based about. But fundamentally, it is about a family of Pungandongo, what is today we call modern day Angola. That family have struggled against slavery. In the end, they lost their kingdom. As a result of that, the rest of the entire family was sent to Brazil. So this is what the book is about. It's about slavery. It's about the concentration of power in the hands of Portuguese, but also it's about how African attempt to manage that process. And that leads us to the case that we are now talking about in the Vatican. So who was Lorenzo? Who was Lorenzo da Silva Mendonça? Um, the document that we know, Professor Gray, who written first about, about Lorenzo, simply stated the case that we don't know where Mendonça came from. He appeared in the Vatican, but we have no idea. But we now can say for certain that we know that Mendonça came from modern day Angola. He came from Pungandongo and uh, he went to the Vatican and took this case, which represented the case for his own family, but also the case for wider uh, constituencies in the Atlantic at that time. That included uh, Christian, who were part of the community of the churches in the Catholic Church or churches, but also included the case for new Christian, in other words, Jews converted to Christianity, as well as native indigenous. In the coat of armor we see here, what we've seen in the description is what comes from the letter that Mendoza took from the, um, the Vatican ambassador to, um, uh, in Lisbon to the Vatican. And the inscription says there in, in, in the um, Spanish writing or Spanish uh, language, morir es los más cierto. Translated, death is certain. At the top of it, as you can see, that we can see clearly the scale of justice. In the middle is the coat of arms that is represented in the propaganda feeding. That symbol is still there standing today. If you go to the Vatican, you'll see that in a minute. Um, uh, you will see that symbol representing the propaganda feeding. Um, what was at that time the missionary um, society founded by um, the Vatican and so on. So this is what Mendoza took to the Vatican, looking for justice about the question of slavery. The tradition has it that Africans were already involved in the slave trade thousands of years prior to the European arrival in Africa. That has been the accepted wisdom. That has been accepted uh, interpretation. That has been what has been going on until now. Recently, there was a film, or there's a film now called The Queen of Africa, is it? A lot of people have reacted to it, saying Africa is attempting to sanitize history because the interpretation we tend to have is that Africa was already involved in the slave trade. But were they? So who was Mendonca? Mendonca, as I said, he was born in Angola, but we don't know exact date when he was born. And when he died, we don't know either because the document is short. But what we know, he came from Angola, um, and um, this is the family tree of Mendoza that are constructed using documents that are available to us in the archive. From the point of view of Angolan kings, Angola or the king can have two legitimate wives. The third wife called Mokama is also part of that line, but her children are offspring are not permitted to become the king. If the first two ladies do not have children and then Mokama could 
her children could become part of the heir to the throne. But Mendoza's grandfather, Philip, came from Omokama. He should have never been a king, but he was elected by the Portuguese simply because Queen Zinga at that time of Matamba was making it very difficult for the Portuguese. So Philip's children are those, as you can see there, we ran through them very quickly. Um, and then Lorenzo come here um, as in the last, um, there as you can see. So Lorenzo had four brothers or three brothers, including him, Simão, Inácio, Inácio, and so on. Both, all of them were sent to Brazil with him. So what we know was that this was family part of Queen Zinga family. But what has been going on in Angola, as we know, in the early or late 16th century was uh, the question of slavery. Slavery has become the biggest issue uh, that faced the Angolan and so on. So here is what Mendoza's family was all about. But to understand the dynamic of Portuguese operation or the dynamic of Portuguese empire in the 16th or 17th century, we need to understand the operation of power, how it operated in the Atlantic. You have the king at the top, you have the municipal council, those were the Portuguese resident overseas, be that in Luanda, be that in Cape Verde, be that in Pernambuco or Salvador, Bahia, or Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo. Those were part of the municipal council. You then have the overseas council. Overseas council were the councillors to advise the king on issues relating to overseas. These were the governors who were governing in Luanda, who were governing in Cape Verde, who were governing in Brazil as well as India. So the operation of power come into that. The decision about slavery was done from the top, but also it had been reinforced or challenged from within these three powers and so on. So I wanted to talk to you very briefly. I know I haven't got a lot of time, but very often we go back to that question, which the book attempted to challenge, which is this idea that the African were involved in the slave trade. I asked the question, were they involved in the slave trade? People say African in the coastal area were involved in the slave trade. But one thing we do not miss or we do not understand is why were they involved? people who were on those coastal areas. They were conquered people. All the Africans who were in the coastal areas were conquered African kings. Rulers there might have been, they were conquered. Up to now, I have not been able to, prove me wrong tomorrow, but I haven't been able to find any document that show an African king or ruler who were not conquered, who was involved in the slave trade. That is the question that the book is attempting to challenge, or one of the questions. But look at what the Portuguese have done in the rules in terms of how the rulers who were conquered, what they were meant to do. Starting with Mendoza's grandfather. Mendoza's grandfather, Fernando Souza, the Portuguese governor in Luanda, who later on became the overseas council, has decided that he was going to revamp everything that we know as a tax system that was a normal produced tax system, be that tax paying by rice or yam, or whatever that might be, pigs, chicken, and so on. Fernando Sosa said, all of this thing is nonsense. Many chickens who are being brought from the north of Angola coming to Luanda by the time they arrive, they are dead. So we are going to stop all of that. Now, all the African rulers conquered have to pay 100 enslaved persons per year as a tax system. But Andrew Sosa did not stop there. He said, this is going to become an eternal tax system for the generation to come. This started from 1626. The Portuguese way, by the way, uh, they were in where? They were in Angola. They were in what today we call Sierra Leone. They were in what today we call Guinea-Bissau. They were in what today we call Ghana, they were today in what we call Nigeria, Benin. So this system was already introduced prior to British introducing their system of what you may call that came with the African Royal Company. 
Nobody abolished a system that is effective. Economically effective system is not abolished. So this system became a system that is used by all the other colonizers. So you have to pay 100 in slave. I'm going to run through it very quickly. I'm, I'm expecting you to read it with me together. You, also your region as a conquered king is the place where troops are recruited to fight alongside the Portuguese against your African. Get that principle. Men of war are recruited from the region where the Portuguese were conquered. You also have to open your place region for the market for the Portuguese to be trading. You also have to retain everybody that ran away that was viewed as a runaway in slave. You have to retain them. <coughs> that is one of your conditions. You have to allow priests to build churches and do their mission in the area. Your land is to be alienated and then your children can then be taken to school and, and so on. But also they're protecting you against your enemy. So, so those were the rules. So then we ask, why were the African involved? Once you are conquered, your hands are short. Your hands are tied up. You have to do it precisely as your conqueror has said. Maybe something we can talk about later on. So this is what Mendoza's grandfather was fighting. He said to the Portuguese, you can't treat me as a king like this. The overseer council said, no, you are now the subject of Portugal. So you have to do it the way it is done. So when he died, his children came into power. They were at the Jesuit College of Luanda. They were groomed to become kings. When they finished their um, um, uh, schooling, they returned to Pungandongo. They rejected the Portuguese alliance. They said Ndongo is now independent. This was a time too when Portugal separated from Spain. So the news was reaching Africa, Portugal is independent, Punga Ndongo need its independence. So Baculamento was the new tax system, which started with Mendoza's grandfather. You pay 100 in slave, and that is what it was um, as Fernando Stoza has introduced it. It is going to be eternal, for the successors of the African rulers, they have to pay all of those enslaved African per year. In Angola, the document has it. Kings who were not rulers, who were not able to find anybody to pay, what were they doing? They were paying their own wife and children and babies. That is what the document is saying. It is not easy to capture people. I said to people, war do not produce enslaved people. You can do it only once. The second time people get smarter. And in the economics of the Atlantic, you cannot take somebody whose hands are chopped off and take them for sale. Nobody's going to buy them. That is what the world would do. Because if I'm fighting you in a short distance with sword, what is happening? I lose limbs, you lose limbs. What good is that for that person? So trickery is being used as a way of finding people guilty. Court cases become dominated by the Portuguese. The officers were set in those, in, in those courts. You find guilty of stealing a corn, you were sent to the Atlantic. So that is how numbers were being met. Those who couldn't were running away. But run away to where? Leave your family behind. So it wasn't going to be that easy. So this was the cost of the people who were involved, who were conquered by by the Portuguese. So this was part of what Mendoza was all about. To understand Mendoza's coast case, we have to understand the background of what all of this is about. This is the kingdom. It is now part of the, the UNESCO site in Angola. The kingdom was destroyed. So Mendoza had to fight in conjunction with what his grandfather, his uncle fought and so on. When his grand, uh, uncle returned to Pungandongo, he said, we are no longer going to have alliance with Portugal. Portugal said, no, you can't do that. Your grandfather or your father has signed the agreement. He said, no, we are not going to go back there. We are going back to our tradition of our fathers. Portugal brought troops from, from, from Brazil, from Pernambuco, from Bahia, from Rio de Janeiro, 
to go and fight in Angola. That is why the kingdom was destroyed. But the other thing I wanted to show you very quickly is the mathematics in the Atlantic. One we do not understand very often, people talk about slavery. What are the kings in Europe whose countries are conquering Atlantic? What was happening? Every king in Europe at that time who had a share in the empire in the Atlantic, be that the British, the French, Portuguese, or, or Spanish, a king would get one fifth of every slave that is being sent to Brazil, to the America. 20%. That may sound a small percentage if we were to think about it. But that's what the king would get as a tax system. Every enslaved that being captured, sold, the king would get. Mendoza's grandfather was paying that tax. He ruled in Pungandongo for 38 years. That is the amount of people he needed to pay for that 38 years. One man. Three thousand and eight hundred people. African are involved in the slave trade, correct? Am I talking to myself? Okay. But then the other percentage is very quickly, that is the 20% of the, of, of, of the king in Portugal, in Spain, in, 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 in France or in England and so on, but also their own governor would take 20%. In FGU that is being done from the slave trade. Captain Major would take 20%. When, when Pongandongo was destroyed, Captain Major had the right because of the amount of people that were captured in that one go, the captain major had the right of 700 people. His captain has the right for 700 people. So that is how the, the mathematics was, was divided in the Atlantic, apart from the kings and so on. Question we can be asked later on about that, but we can come back to that. The other statistic I want to shock you with is this. We have in Angola, Luanda at that time, Alvarez, Gaspar de Alvarez, who was one of the wealthier merchants in Luanda. His nickname is the Devil Boy. Why was he called the Devil Boy? Only that story can tell us. His value, he had huge amount of wealth in Congo. He had huge amount of wealth in Luanda, in Angola, in Bahia Salvador, in Argentina. That wealth comes from his will, when he was at the point of dying, that is where it was struck. There's a statistic here which I can't show you, but that is his wealth. Now, if you take that wealth and convert it to how many people he might have bought to get to that amount, that is what we would get. Almost a million people. One man. So Atlantic slavery was a big business, but it was dominated very much in a way that the African were finding it very difficult to get rid of. So Mendoza family, when they rebelled against it, they lost their kingdom, they were sent to Brazil. So this is the journey of the family. Mendoza started from Angola and he was sent to Bahia, Salvador. While he was in Salvador, the Portuguese knew that there were a lot of enslaved Angolan in the, in, in, in the city. So they thought, okay, it is going to be in, impossible for Mendoza to stay here with his family. We better send them to Rui because if they stayed in, in Salvador, they could run away and enjoy. They uh, joined what you call the runaway enslaved community in the northeast of Brazil, in Pernambuco. So they feared, so they sent him to Rio de Janeiro with his family. And then in Rio, they realized it was the same thing. Because when they were sent to, to Salvador, they were sent as a free people. Their clothing, the houses the where they were living was all paid by the Portuguese crown. Why? Because of their grandfather service that he did for the Portuguese for that 38 years. So they realized they couldn't keep them in Brazil. They sent them to Lisbon. In Lisbon, Mendoza was sent to Braga to study and the rest of other family were sent to different monastery. He returned to Lisbon and then from Lisbon, he traveled to Madrid and Madrid there 
he went to the Vatican. This is the distribution of the family, how they were sent to Brazil in different groups and so on. I'll move very quickly from that. That is a letter. This is where Mendonca studied. And we go back now to Mendonca's case. That is a letter he took to the Vatican. The King of Portugal was meant to give him a letter, but he got that letter from the ambassador of Vatican living in the city of Lisbon. The King of Portugal at that time was not a king, he was a regent, he couldn't give him a letter. For Mendonca to go to Vatican, he needed a letter from the Vatican ambassador as well as the king of that country. Dom Pedro II couldn't because he was not a king at that time. That is why he traveled to Madrid. Uh, in Madrid, he then was given the letter. So the phrase we have, morir es los mal certo, come from the Latin word. More certa es at eos ora incerta es. Death is certain, but his hours is not known. So why Mendoza choose to use the phrase, death is certain, and dropped the hour? It is clearly that in the Atlantic, death is no longer anything we can imagine. It was happening daily to the enslaved Africans. That is what he was questioning to the Vatican. The predicament of the African were there to be seen. It was daily. It was an induced death. That is the building where the case was presented. The propaganda feeding. That's why I was saying, do you look at the symbol at the top? Is that precisely? But why Mendoza went to the Vatican? How many minutes do I still have, David? How many minutes do I still have? <laughs> one minute. <laughs> okay, let's run one minute very quickly to finish, to finish the talk. Mendoza was questioning the document, the bulls that were sent, that was given to the Portuguese kings to allow them to enslave the African. These are all the popes that sent the bull to allow the African to be enslaved. Mendoza argued very strongly. That was one of the, the, the bulls which says very clearly how the Portuguese were to utilize their own power. What Mendoza was talking about, he says slavery was practiced against all four principles that was known at that time in Europe. Slavery was practiced against human law. Usano contra ogni legge umano. It was practiced against human law. The law which says as a human being, nobody has the right to enslave another human. Because in the nature, we all are equal. Natural law says every human being is born free. With natural law, we don't need to know the right and wrong of God because all of that is enshrined within us. Usano contra ogni legge naturale. He said, Slavery was practiced against divine law. The law that governed both human and natural law was also being contravened in the Atlantic. Usano contra ogni legge divina. He said, slavery is practiced against civil law. Our right as a human being. How? This was the problem in the Atlantic. Mendoza proposes the question, the slavery should be abolished within seven years. The way the document was presented is here. This is why I differ from Gray. Gray has said this was a protest. But it was, if it was a protest, legally fine. But if it was a protest for the sake of it, no, it was not. This was a full-blown case. The case was presented in the Vatican in three different forms. A, B, and C, you have the Lorenz's case and uh, the Milini and so on and so we have Milini who won't be in charge. Vatican was worried about what Mendoza presented. So Milini was asked to ask the governor of Spain to find out what was going on. The governor of Italy to find out what was going on. All have denied it saying Mendoza, what he was saying was not possible in the Atlantic. So the crime Mendoza presented was this, African were being taken by force. It was a deliberately done, and there was no justice for this that we can talk about African, uh, that there might have been something else going on in Africa at that time, or African were capturing their own people as a result of that, they were selling them. 
the judge from Madrid, when they hear many of these other crimes being committed in, in, in the region of Congo, Angola, Madrid Crown sent the judge called Fajardo. That is also a document that nobody has talked about. What Fajardo came up with, his report back to Madrid was, there was no just war in Angola. There was no slave in Angola. All the people are being captured were captured by force. Okay? So this is what it is about. What is Mendoza talking about? Justice is what is required. Freedom for the African. The court, last, the court case lasted for two years. The Vatican decided to question the leaders, the kings of Spain, the kings of Portugal, to do something in the Atlantic. We perhaps can talk about that. I haven't got more time to discuss the detail of all of that, but I will finish it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, as I said earlier, um, there'll be time for questions at the end. So all the questions that you have for Jose, uh, please note them down for later. Uh, and th thank you for presenting that evidence. And, and I think a lot of us have probably been challenged today. Uh, and now to introduce Machilu, I think he'll be speaking to something that maybe hasn't changed very much in the last 400 years that Jose has spoken on. So on equality, diversity and inclusion, Machilu. Okay, good evening. I think I need to turn this on. Can you hear me? Oh, this is a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for that enriching and that really um, in-depth conversation. I'm trying to just get to my slides. Are they more, this is backwards or forward? Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, there, hang on. Okay, so um, it, it is such a pleasure to come and speak at one of these um, Afoxes and Sakas. Um, I have looked at them in the past in envy and have listened to some, so many of this, these discussions. So it's, a, it's such a pleasure to come and speak to you. Um, so although I have a background in social science research, this evening, I'm speaking to you from the perspective of a practitioner. I am an equality diversity manager at UCL. But what I'd like to do today is to really start a conversation with you about how universities can move beyond simply identifying barriers to postgraduate students' progression to discussing ways in which universities can remove these barriers. My hope is that during this session, um, this will spur, on, spur you on to think about other ideas and to perhaps even consider ways in which universities can remove these barriers. So now a useful way to understand um, the barriers that students face is by unpacking how systemic oppression works and then developing anti-oppressive actions to address systemic oppression. So while oppression at universities impacts both staff and students, I want to take this opportunity to speak to you graduate, postgraduate students and to just shine a spotlight on how international postgraduate students are affected. So, some of you may have seen this plaque before. Has anyone seen it? Ah, okay, one of you. Okay, so this um, international students have been coming to the UK from as early as the 1700s. On the screen, you'll see a plaque that is at University College. Um, and it's a plaque that was put there in 2017 in honor of a Sierra Leonean student, um, Christian Cole. So Christian Cole was the first black African to be a awarded a degree at Oxford in 1876. He went on to be the first black African to practice law in English courts. He then returned to Africa and sadly, it's reported that he died of smallpox in Zanzibar um, at the young age of 33. Now, for those among you who are observant, you may have noticed that the plaque reads that Christian Cole was made a member of University College in 1877. And I mentioned he graduated in 1876. 
Now, this is because Cole was admitted as a non-collegiate student. Non-collegiate students, or what they had at that term, um, time called unattached students, were students who were first um, were admitted from 1868 in Oxford. And this was part of a move to um, towards the later half of the 19th century. It was part of a move to open it um, to open Oxford up to um, more poorer a more poorer class of, of, of the population. Um, when Christian Cole came to Oxford, he couldn't afford college fees. And it's only later that he became a member of University College through um, its master, George Bradley. Now, a few of the records that were present at the time of Christian Cole's time at Oxford tell a story um, of how he needed to work as a music student to, um, to well, as a music tutor to support himself with the little income um, he had from family when the little income he had from family in Sierra Leone had died out. Stories also tell us, unsurprisingly, that no matter how accomplished he was, the public turned him into a figure of fun, and he was portrayed as a minstrel in a mortarboard, spectacles, and a scholar's gown. Professor Michelle Mendelssohn here at Oxford captures some of this story in her book, Making Oscar Wilde. Christian Cole was a contemporary of Oscar Wilde. You can also read more about Christian Cole um, in the book that's actually listed on the plaque called Black Oxford Untold Stories. It's written by Pamela Roberts. And in fact, just yesterday, there was a book launch for another um, book that Pamela Roberts has written called The Adventures of, Black, of a Black Edwardian Intellectual. And that is based on the life of James Arthur Harley, who was an alumni of Jesus College. So for those of you who haven't seen the plaque, when you take a stroll to University College, have a look for it. So today, there are just over about 750,000 postgraduate students in the UK. About a third of these are international students from outside of the, um, the European Union. The majority of these students, you will um, not be surprised to know, come from China, India, and Nigeria, to name a few countries. The UK is also the second largest, um, second after the United States, with regard to the global market share of international students in higher education. Um, the Higher Education Policy Initiative estimates that international students make a net positive contribution of more than 25.9 billion pounds to the UK economy. That was a statistic that was released earlier this year. That's huge. And so it goes without saying that it is in the best interest of universities to create and maintain environments where postgraduate students can flourish, where they're able to thrive. Now, unfortunately, international students continue to report that they ex experience discrimination based on their, um, on their racialized identities um, or based on intersectional identities, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, and religion and belief. And this treatment can be described as oppressive. So what is oppression? <laughs> oppression is cruel and unfair and characterized by not affording people the same freedom, rights, or opportunities that others have been given. The types of oppression that seem to first come to people's minds when we think about oppression are what we call overt oppression. These are conscious and deliberate actions of intolerance by individuals or groups. While this type of oppression exists, there is more recent evidence um, through surveys for, among students and also through um, other academic papers that international postgraduates experience more, co more covert of, um, oppression in universities. COVID oppression includes expressions of discriminatory ideas, attitudes, or beliefs in subtle hidden forms. It's often unchallenged and doesn't appear to be discriminatory because of its indirect behavior. The unfortunate thing is that targets of COVID oppression only realize that an oppressive act has happened um, after it has taken place. Um, and there are several types of responses that 
people who've experienced oppression tend to characterize or to show. So it's common for people who've experienced oppression to second guess themselves and their reactions to the oppression they faced. You'll hear them say things like, did that really just happen? Did anyone else see that? And it's also common for those who witness this type of oppression to be hesitant to respond, thinking that the target doesn't seem that, that upset or that they're wanting to, um, they don't know if, if any interference that they make will, will make any changes. Now, the way I describe oppression here is quite broad. Um, this, this is a description of kind of broad oppression. The law in the UK focuses on four types of oppression, namely direct and indirect discrimination, and then harassment and victimization. Now in the UK, all of us are legally protected from these forms of oppression based on nine characteristics. The characteristics include protections you'd imagine, so like on the basis of disability, race or ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, age, pregnancy, and maternity or marriage and civil partnership. I should add that the protections under religion and belief also include a protection for those with no belief. And protections under gender reassignment include a protection for those who, have, who are planning to undergo gender reassignment. Beyond these protections, public institutions like universities have a duty to advance equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic, so one of those, and people who don't. They also are obliged to foster good relations, again, between people who have these shared protected characteristics and those that don't. And one of the universities, um, one of the ways universities can achieve these goals, I argue, is through engaging in anti-oppressive actions. So what do I mean by anti-oppressive? This is a long quote, so I have it on the screen for you to have a look at. So Clifford in 1995 came up with this definition of anti-oppressive, and he uses the term to indicate an explicit evaluative position that constructs social divisions as matters of broad social structure, at the same time as being personal and organizational issues. It looks at the use and abuse of power not only in relation to individual or organizational behavior, which may be overtly, covertly, or indirectly racist, classist, sexist, and so on, but also in relation to broader social structures. For example, you know, the health system, the education system, political or economic systems, the media, et cetera. And, it looks at, and he looks at this um, and their routine provision of services and rewards for powerful groups at local and um, national and international levels. <laughs> Now, he also looks at how he also describes how these factors impinge on people's life stories in unique ways that have have to be understood in their social historical complexity. We could spend another whole talk discussing this. But I think the important thing here to note is that power at individual at individual and organizational level is not mutually exclusive. It's interconnected. Now for our discussion, what I want to do is to focus on how universities can respond with individuals. So for instance, getting staff to operate in a particular way and organizational, for example, changing policies and procedures and how they can re respond in these ways to break barriers for international postgraduate students. Now, one of the ways I've found useful um, in terms of trying to understand this is through depicting the cycle of oppression um, and this is an, a framework that helps us to develop anti-oppressive practices. Just as I'll describe the cycle of oppression. So some of you, has anyone seen this before? Okay, some of you may have come across this. Um, this is a model that was developed by Sherry Schmidt in 1994, um, when she was working on some of her anti-racism um, material. Um, for those of you who may have seen, um, who, who might not have seen this, um, who may have seen this, um, it's also, the model is also done in, in, in the sense of it leading to internalized oppression. But what I want to talk, focus on is system, um, systemic oppression. So essentially the way it starts, the way the cycle starts is 
we receive messages from around the world, from our families, friends, um, and sometimes these messages are stereotypes about particular groups. Now, when these stereo, oh, well, let me give you an example. So for an, an example, for postgraduate students, maybe for instance, that um, international postgraduate students with degrees, with undergraduate degrees from outside of the UK do not perform as well as those with UK undergraduate degrees. So hold that thought in mind. Now, when a belief like that becomes prolific, and when it begins to gain credibility um, or weight in, in a university, it, be, it leads to prejudice. Um, it's then you have moments where people um, experience behavior, let's say, in one individual, and they generalize that behavior to, towards that particular individual's group. Once these ideas are reinforced by society, they can lead to discrimination. So again, now, for instance, looking at um, applications for postgraduate study from specific countries through the lens that students from those particular countries are unlikely to perform as well or better than home students. Now, when this discrimination continues to occur on an institutional level, when it begins to become systematized, that's when oppression occurs. And that's when it becomes embedded in processes and practices. Now, the thing that maintains these processes and practices is power. Now, universities need to be engaging in anti-oppressive actions that, are, that dismantle this cycle at various stages. So let's talk about that. So for instance, to avoid stereotypes taking hold, universities can promote role models. Um, they can encourage critical thinking among its students, but also critical thinking among its academics. And I'll share an example here. So um, international postgraduate students have often um, reported in surveys um, that cur their curriculum is quite, um, is dominated with Western perspectives. Um, they've said that even when African or other kinds of perspectives are engaged with, um, what happens is, is that these um, they're engaged with in a way that reinforces Eurocentrism. Now, to stop prejudice becoming discrimination, universities can begin to become introspective about where bias creeps in into its processes and procedures, and then adapt them accordingly. So again, for instance, ensuring that applications for postgraduate study are assessed in a fair manner. To stop discrimination from becoming oppression, university governance structures should incorporate ways to facilitate democracy and accountability. So accountability, for instance, in the form of being transparent about the progression of international postgraduate stu students, are there attainment gaps for these students and where are they and what can be done to, to eliminate those gaps? Building on this, one of the ways universities can prevent systemic oppression is by sharing power. Now at the moment, the easiest way that I can think of and others have thought of um, in, in terms of doing this is through student representation um, on university committees, student representation on decision-making bodies, but I know that there may be other ways in which we can um, tackle this, but also tackle this, the cycle of oppression at different places. Um, so I'm gonna stop now and really look forward to listening to your questions and listening to your thoughts and ideas of what I've shared. Thank you. Thanks so much, Machilo. I think uh, both presentations speak quite well um, to each other, but I will give uh, an opportunity for questions. Um, so if anybody has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I I have two questions, one for each person. I, I, I want to ask for your view about what about the about the expression of um, what they call modern slavery that is happening and there are some characteristics or some some characteristics that have been termed modern slavery in Africa. So what is your view? Is it actually happening? Is, is, the, is there a reflection of the of the past happening presently? What's your view about that? Then the for you, I want to ask about what you think about the English language. Um, because for instance, for example, if you are to, if one of the, uh, the requirements to come to, for example, the UK or the or other countries is that you have to meet up the English language requirement. And then they require that you write some of these exams. For example, I'm from Nigeria and uh, I understand, you understand that Nigeria is an English language. Uh, the lingua franca of Nigeria is English language, but yet most of the schools require that you do one of these exams is a part of the discrimination thing. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take one more question. My questions for Dr. Jose. I thought it was extremely interesting all the that you mentioned. And I was thinking about the forms of resistance that we had uh, in Brazil, Colombus, and that later I discovered that actually the Colombus from Brazil, they were forms of resistance that actually were originated in the African continent, especially, for example, if we are talking about Angola. So I would like to know if the existence of Quilombos, uh, they played any role in Mendonça's case to the Vatican. And I would also like to know how do you perceive the importance of Quilombos for the liberation movement in Brazil and in Angola? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jose, uh, would you like to go first? So answering the question about uh, modernist slavery and the Quilombos. Okay. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much indeed for your question. Um, it is an area of research, you know, looking at 17th century and then going to looking at 20th century. It is a quite a, what you may call a huge gap. Um, I could easily provide you a response that is very much a reflection of 17th century. 18th century rather than the 20th or 21st century. I am not too much acquainted with literature in relation to what you may call modern slavery. But what I understand from the bit that I have read, modern slavery in Africa or in other region of Africa it's very often it's talked about people, say for example, the cases they say, you know, children are being taken out of school, they're doing work and so on. You have non-government organization would say that is a form of slavery. Um, these kids shouldn't have been at work and they should be at school. In other cases, you have also movement of kids being taken or being ruptured or taken somewhere else. I think the perception, rather than giving you a long-winded answer, the perception is that we have something that happened in the 17th century. We also have a culture that is being passed on. You read people like Christopher Herrett. Christopher Herrett is the opinion that Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, there was no slavery until the introduction of Islam. He said it that brought in what today we understand to be slavery. But prior to that, there was no slavery. So in other words, if we are to take that response as a positive understanding of what African culture might have been or cultures, then we are heading into some difficulties in terms of understanding it. 
uh, the understanding of, of slavery. But the other thing I wanted to go back to your question rather than feel as if I'm avoiding your question, but it is not, is what do we mean by slavery? What is a slave in terms of how we understand this as a concept? Because very often we look at Atlantic slavery, we are talking about the complete different things, even in Africa at that time. People use the term slavery, but you won't, you won't find that concept. In Angola in particular, we have the Portuguese historian, Cardonega, who's written quite a lot in the 17th century. And he argued that, you know, concept, in other words, his attempt to understand what he perceived to be slavery, he was using three different concepts in Portuguese. Slave, a servant, or somebody just simply who is being brought in to do some work. So from my understanding of what we understand today as slavery in Africa, we're talking about two completely different concepts. Either we're talking about people whom we think they're being forced to do labor. But in African culture, very often, from what we know, even here in Britain, you ask kids to go and buy something. You ask it to do chores in the house. In Africa, sometimes you have family who perhaps they don't have, they send their child to learn a skill in somebody else's hand. Is that a slavery? So these are questions we need to be asking. So I'm talking as somebody who hasn't done a lot of work in that period in, in the modern African slavery, but I'm just giving you the question in the common sense understanding from the very few literature that I have read. So I hope, I have not answered your question at all, <laughs> but perhaps, yeah, um, but I'm not trying to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Going back to the question about, about um, Kilombo Palmares uh, resistance and so on, Kilombo Palmares was important, or Kilombo in general was very important, because these were the runaway communities that formed their communities in Brazil. I have argued in the book that the African didn't go deliberately to go and set those Quilombos in Brazil. If they did, they may not have called them Quilombos at all, because the word we have in Kimbundu language that the Portuguese use, which is the Quilombo, is very much a camp outside of the normal community. Some would say those were camps like in the circumcision ceremony, where the boys would go for three months outside. They learned the skill how to become man or men, and then they return. But the Portuguese also use another word called mocambos, which is also meaning in the Kumbundo, meaning similar word. But I, I went for another word in Kumbundo, which is makamba, rather than mokambo. Makamba means community, community of friends. So I have argued that, you know, the Portuguese use the term quilombo deliberately as a way of seeing them as a camp, camps which were resisting to attack the Portuguese settlement. By doing that, then they would have the license to attack those camps. But if they have viewed them, as a community of Fen Makamba, they would see that the African who were running away were not running away with the intention of coming to home to Portuguese, but they were running away to form their own community, to have a living with the native. Run away from just running away, but they were running away to the area where the native were. So for me, I think the African who ran away in Brazil, who didn't have anybody to hide them, were captured. But those who run away in conjunction with the native run away because the native befriend them. So I think resistance is very important within, within those camps. But that came as a secondary thing. It is only when the Portuguese attacked them, then they begin to realize we have to defend ourselves. So, you know, resistance is very important as it is also in Angola. You know, what people often don't realize that slavery, this is why I'm arguing very strongly in the book, is not natural to the African understanding. If it was, why do we have community of Quilombos? Why would you run away for something that is so normal to you? 
if slavery is normative in Africa, why were the Africans running away from enslavement? Some say, well, maybe because they were treated badly. No, it is more than that. There is something sacrosanct in our humanity, which is freedom. And this is what these people were looking for. They were running away. Africans were running away in Angola. They were running away in San Tome. They were running away in Cape Verde, as well as in the Atlantic. So clearly something is wrong here about the principle. But I think the idea of running away, answering your question, is fundamental for the African, because what he's showing us is that nobody wants slavery. Slavery is alien to our understanding of our humanity. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Machilo, if you could answer the question about the languages, and I have a question as well about what you think um, the university's responsibilities are and think about the UK in a broader environment, environment of hostility against um, yeah, international students or migrants more broadly. Okay, so I'll start with um, your question. Um, I don't have a direct answer. I definitely think that what you've described is exclusionary. Um, I, I'm trying to remember what the current policies are, but I do know that they, if you had um, an undergraduate degree in certain English speaking universities and you were applying for postgraduate study in the UK, you didn't have to take you know, certain TOEFL exams, et cetera. And I remember previously that there was some discussion about that because say for instance, you, had, you completed your degree in South Africa in an English speaking South African university. You did not encounter the barrier of taking another English exam. But if you completed your degree in another country, like you said, in Nigeria, you had to do that. So there is this, it's exclusionary based on um, what I would argue are certain hierarchies. <laughs> Um, so I would, I would go as far as that. I know that there ha has been some resistance towards this, a little bit in, in higher education, but there's been more resistance um, when it comes to national health um, NHS staff. Um, so nurses, international nurses who come to the UK and have to reach a particular English level in an exam. And the argument there has been that they don't necessarily need to be writing essays. <laughs> in the English language to do their job. Um, so I think that's a roundabout way to say to you, I think it is exclusionary. I'm not too sure where the debates are at the moment, but where the debate has been um, pushed the most is in the world of work, I mean, and in particular with the NHS. Um, coming to your question, could you just repeat the talk at the end of what you said? It's just responsibilities that universities have to their students when the university is in the context of sort of broader hostility against. That again is really tricky, but it also did, it's, it's also determined, um, it also depends on what's going on. So it's very common for universities um, to respond to international students who may be affected by, let's say, war or something else that's happening in their own home country. So, for instance, um, years back when the Syrian war broke out, um, there were displaced international students um, across the UK and universities. And the way that universities responded then was to provide things like housing, um, scholarships, etc. So there are certain instances when you, where uni universities respond quite quickly. But then there are other instances, and I think this goes back to how I spoke about sometimes oppression being covert. So when it comes to more difficult, um, more covert oppression, it's harder, I think, for universities to be almost convinced to respond. But when something is quite direct and overt, um, I must say, I think the universities in the UK tend to respond quite quickly, um, whether it's through um, sending emails to, you know, affected student groups saying, you know, if anybody needs support, use our student welfare and support services, etc. So there are some, um, there, there's some things that are in place, but what we don't have is something that can support students when these, co when covert oppression occurs. Thank you. Uh, we are running very much behind on time. I think we'll take one more question and then I'll ask um, Machilu and Jose to, to wrap up. Um, so, uh, Kelly, yep. Yeah.
Um, thank you so much for your presentations. My question is to Dr. Michu, and I'll just limit it to one. So you spoke about the, you spoke about the uh, cycle of oppression and systemic oppression more specifically, and in its final stage, it's upheld by power. Now, in the context of the United Kingdom and higher education here, we know that oftentimes there is a bottom line of profit, um, and oftentimes there is a bottom line with institutions like Oxford with reputation. So thinking about systemic oppression being upheld by power, how can universities build institution, um, institutional incentives to become anti-oppressive? And is there a way to do this without resorting to tokenism? Thank you. Yeah. That is a, a really, um, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Um, yes, there are so many things at play there. Um, there's the economics of things. Um, but I think I'm going to use exa an example. I think more recently, in 2020, um, during the murder, when George Floyd was murdered, um, universities in America, universities in the UK, um, you know, experienced students um, protesting and demanding um, change. And I think that was a moment um, when a number of us who were here at Oxford University noticed a shift. And that shift came out of student movements. And those student movements have been happening at Oxford in particular for a number of years. Um, there's a book by Stephen Tuck, who's a professor of history here, and he tracks student movements and resistance in Oxford um, in the 1970s and you know, before that. I think the buildup of that student movement from the 17 onwards up until, you know, um, 2010 or 12, when Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford took place and a whole lot of other movements. Um, and that all of that in 2020 shone a spotlight on specifically race equality at Oxford and in other universities across the country in a way that it hasn't been before. And I, for, as a practitioner, was quite struck by how the response did not have to be motivated by, by money. So at that time, a number of us EDI practitioners um, were able to harness things like more resources, <laughs> more funding, more money. At Oxford, there was a race equality task force that, um, that began to spur on more work here. That didn't only happen at Oxford, it happened at UCL, where I am, and other universities across the country. So while I understand that there's this interplay of economic sort of, that plays with universities, you know, economic um, demands, there is something I think that we cannot neglect that um, student movements and in particular, the power of those and the power for change that after about 10 years in this, in this field, I think has, can make, can, can, can cause change. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, but I think that there is, I'm not as pessimistic as I was before. <laughs> Um, and so while 2020 was a difficult year, what has risen from that time, I think has led to at least some interventions that will, that will cause change. All right, thank you. I think we'll wrap it up there. We have a drinks reception just outside. So you'll have an opportunity to, to speak to our guests today. Thank you so much everybody for joining us. Thank you for staying. We hope to see you at the next in Slacker. Oh, thank you. Oh.